So we all know physics in Urbana Champagne is in Loomis Laboratory. That's where we are. Right? No. Physics is everywhere. Physics is in the atom, in the universe, in the TV set, and also in the human body. And that is what I want to talk to, uh, about today to you. I will talk about the bones, the ears and the eyes because we have too much physics in the body. So we have to concentrate and focus. The lecture will be great. Uh, that's not because of me, but because of my co-workers, uh, graduate students and, uh, and uh, postdocs who helped me with the lecture. First, Jordi uh, Cohen, he's our bone doctor. Uh, Eric Lee is a bone smasher, be careful with him. Zhang <laughs> uh, uh, Zhu Cheng is our acoustics engineer, you will see him in action soon. Um, Emma Falk is our opera singer. Uh, Jen is our eye donor, she looks a little sad. And uh, Marco Sotomayor is our eye doctor. So we together made this lecture about how evolution shaped the body. Evolution works by trial and error. And uh, evolution had many, many years of time to improve <coughs> the, the all species, all biological species in particular, <coughs> during the last many thousand years, the human body. And as I said, we concentrate and let's first look at slim, it's my friend, and look at the balls. So, the bones, there are one type of bones in the human body. They are the, the bones that we see here, but there are also bones, for example, our ears. Ears are sort of made of cartilage. They are soft, so we can, we can, uh, uh, we can move them a little bit. And, uh, uh, <coughs> <that's>, and <coughs> so what all these bones have in common is that they are made of the same material, collagen, it's called. You see here a molecule of collagen, and this is how many of these molecules look together. And they make the ear, and they make the, the, the bones, for example, in the arm. Now, um, <coughs> the difference is that in the, the bones in the arm, they are uh, calcified and, uh, and thereby stronger. And that's very necessary. And you see here that if we wouldn't have the bones that hold our skin, our bones together through the skin and through the bones, we would shiver away. And so we need these collagens to make things firm. Uh, the bones that are made, the, the firm bones are made 30% of the collagen and 70% of, uh, of the calcium, calcium phosphate, that's a mineral, that gives them strength, whereas the collagen gives them shape. Now let's now look at the bones close, at the real bones. Uh, what you need to have available for that is physics. And uh, uh, Kevin Pitts mentioned the Beckman Institute, where I reside. He has no reason to be jealous, because the offices at Beckman are much smaller than in Loomis. <laughs> but we have this wonderful electron microscope there. With the electron microscope, you can study all kinds of things. For example, you can study here the surface of a CD. You may have wondered, well, how do CDs play music? And here you see the engraving on the CD. You would never be able to recognize it with your bare eye. But with an electron microscope, you see all the tones made on the CD. Or here you see a chip, a computer chip, that is also way too small to see the circuitry with your eyes. But you can also use electron microscope to see living things. You probably all recognize what this is. This is an art, and you see how beautiful close-up view we can get from, uh, from with the electron microscope. And now let's use 
electron microscope to look at the dots. Uh, here you see first how this electron microscope works. Uh, what you do is you send electrons. Electrons, these are the smallest known negatively charged particles through a magnet, and the magnet can tilt the electrons, force them back across the sample you want to check out with your, with your microscope. So just like you host with the electron beam your sample, and then you look at where the electron sits the sample with a camera. So this is what the, uh, the camera does, and you see here how it would have looked like if it would all be a little bigger. And so this uh, electron microscope is, uh, is located at the Beckman Institute, and uh, one of the students that I introduced early, earlier, the, the bones measure, Eric Lee, sits there right now. I told him, Eric, don't sleep so long today. You have to, we want to look at the bones. And so, uh, even though we just had a big exam yesterday, he volunteered to get up early, and uh, he sits, I hope, at the Beckman Institute. But before he went there, he smashed a few bones. And we put small, small pieces of water, actually very, very small, the whole little disc there is just about this big. And uh, he has put it under the electron microscope, somewhere there, and uh, he will help us to look at this with a huge magnification that you would never be able to realize with a normal microscope. So here we see now a human body, one of the stronger bones, the bones of the human body, I'd like to say here, the, 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 the arm bone or even the leg bone, a pretty strong bone. The bone has actually inside pretty soft material and outside is very strong. And so this is how it looks like when we, uh, this is how, it, how the strong part looks like. It is made of many of these sort of spherical uh, units and we see data, they are sealing up. <coughs> And they have holes inside where blood vessels go through the bone because the bone is not something there and it may appear to you, but rather the bone is constantly remade. And so you need to have a blood supply so that the biological cells that constantly remake the bone can actually uh, live because they have nutrients. Where do these uh, biological cells live? They live in these little holes there and they are called osteocytes. And uh, this is what we want to look at. We want to know go on the discovery tour and see for ourselves how this bone is made. So here you see one of the pictures that we get from the electron microscope. And so in the meantime, uh, Eric, but he heard me already, uh, it, the tech man, he put up this image of, the, of this bone. You see here the bigger, the bigger holes where the blood vessels go to the bone. And now Eric, a little closer. And so now he gets a little closer. Now you see, the, to begin to see also the, the, the little holes here where the osteocytes live that, that continuously remake uh, the bone. So, so he gets us closer and closer. Now you see that, that these, these uh, blood vessel holes are looked so, uh, are not disappeared even. You're getting a closer, finer, finer view. And here you see where the osteocytes live. Now we don't see the magnification, so I don't know at, at the moment what it is. Um, so uh, I assume we have only a magnifi magnification of a few thousand. Eric promised me to put the magnification there, but it somehow disappeared. So um, maybe later we see. So it's a few thousand, and now you see that the bone is, is something alive. It has holes that blood goes through, and it has little caves where the osteocytes live, the cells that are chewing up the old bone and making constantly fresh bone. Now, how do these uh, the cave dwellings look like of these uh, osteocytes and, the, and for the blood vessels? We want to see that. So Eric, give us a new view. We now cut it from, from the side. I hope he hears me. And then we want to see now a view where we can see the shape of these holes. 
So it's a little bit difficult to communicate, but it looks like you have now a new image coming. And here we see actually also magnification. This is a, this is a tenth of a millimeter, this length here. So it's a pretty good uh, magnification. And, uh, and now we see the side of it. And you see now that these holes that we see here are actually long channels where the blood vessels can go through the holes. And here you see also a little bit the osteo where the osteocytes live. There are also little long channels like a whole system in your body where all these cells live that constantly chew the old bone and make fresh bone. So here we have a real experiment, a pretty good magnification of the of, of, of the bone. So this is a the, this is a hard part of the bone, and uh, here you see where the osteocytes live. Here you see that it is even a bigger magnification that we cannot achieve quite. The reason is that under our preparation conditions, uh, the osteocyte in the cells uh, so got a little bit. Uh, 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 stressed by us, we, we are not so, uh, we physicists are not so good in preparing bones, so, so they sort of died. And so this is why I have to show you uh, and this picture from the medical journal where they can look at these bones without these osteocytes dying. So uh, uh, now what we want to do is we want to look at the inside of the bone. The inside of the bone is, uh, the bone is not firm, but the inside of the bone is hollow. How can it be hollow and still strong? Just like a bridge. A bridge is hollow, but you can still have a heavy train go across it. Because the bridge is built in such a way that the strain, the stress from the weight of the train, is being guided uh, 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 away from these open spaces. So you, you, you want to put stress, but you want to move the stress so that you keep openings. Why do you keep openings under the bridge? For the water to flow and for the ships to, to move along. Why do we want to keep openings in the bone? What's going on in the bone that we have to keep something there? Nothing is flowing through the bones. The bones do something very important to the body. They make new blood cells. They make actually also many other new cells, like stem cells, but in particular they make new blood cells all the time. And this is uh, in a part of the bone called the spongy or the soft bone. And here we see now our discovery with our electron microscope at the Beckman Institute where we're getting this very close view of the soft, of the spongy bone where uh, where what is born in the in the bone and the new blood cells are born so that we constantly refresh our blood and uh, so it's another exciting thing we see with the, with the tools of physics to find out uh, that in the bone that is not a firm filled material but it's just like in the bridge there are many many openings where the strain on the bone uh, goes past the opening so that there's space for making new blood. So this is what we saw here. Now, uh, some bones, however, don't have the privilege to make blood. They have to be very, very firm. They have to take a lot of weight. So no, no uh, blood is made there. And uh, there you actually build the bone in a way that we know also from, from human experience for example, plywood. Each piece of plywood here is made of many, many lamina, many sort of sheets of, 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 uh, of wood are uh, glued together. And that makes the plywood, even though it's made from pretty cheap wood, very strong. And nature discovered this long ago, and it also makes the firm bones, bones in, uh, like uh, for many, many sheets. Well, this is very irregular, but you can recognize here sort of sheets here. And these are just like many hands on top of each other, building these very, very firm bones of those bones that have to take a lot of weight. And so here you see this actual discovery from the Beckman Institute. Here you see it up close. Right now, if you look there, we see 
Eric, can you get a little closer here? Let me see a little bit more here, these edges. Okay, thank you. Very good. So, the last bone is the softest bone in the body. And this is the bone, quote, that makes our ears. That has to be a very soft bone. That is also the collagen that makes normal bone, but it's not calcified. So that the ears are nice, soft, very good for me to sleep at night. I would, I prefer my soft ears over if they would be just like bone. Then I have to sleep only on my, on my belly or on my back. It's much better. So this is all nature made it. And here you see the view that we see now from, uh, from collagen. I see here we still have the other one. Eric, we want the collagen. Eric, there is a collagen coming. Here we see the collagen. Here we see actually the individual collagen cells. So right, and we look at it. Uh, Eric, get really close. And now we're getting very close, getting closer, closer, until we see actually not even closer. Here we have the magnification. Can you read it? 257, uh, 1,000, go further. Four, four, four thousand. Oh, we can do better than this. We cannot today. He's not doing better today. I thought he did it the other day. He did uh, over 20,000. 40,000. Oh, he's, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's zooming. It takes a while. It takes a while. The discovery is not easy. So here we see the details of what this collagen is being made of. Strands of molecules, of big molecules. Here we have now a magnitude of 60 or 32,000, 32,000. That's a very, very close view. We see actually what these bones are made of. We begin to see the molecules that are making actually these collagen bones and where they develop the strengths. And this is where the physics comes in. The, the properties, the physical properties of this molecule woven together into strands just like a, like a rope. And that then goes even further into the bone, makes the collagen and makes the bone. So you have now made the first series of discoveries between Loomis and Beckman seeing of the wood collaboration. And uh, you saw also that the physics is needed because for the instrument is a physics instrument, the electro microscope. Okay, that was number one. Now we come to number two, the ear. The ear is also an interesting physical instrument of our body. Now, we want to be very practical with the ear. But I want to tell you how you can make money with the ear. How you can make, when you understand how the ear works, how you can actually make, make, uh, uh, repel teenagers and, uh, and win the uh, ID Nobel Prize. It's uh, the, the Nobel Prize, the alternative Nobel Prize that was actually given this year exactly for a device uh, to repel teenagers. And we will learn about this now. First, how is it looking like? Uh, the ear is actually first an amplifier. So we have pretty big ears that amplifies already the sound by factor two. Some people are known to have even bigger ears, they amplify it by a factor three. Now when you go to the eardrum, you amplify by a factor uh, by a factor uh, 15 when you go across there and then we have a series of the smallest bones in the human body very 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 tiny they are called the hammer the anvil and the steer and they make the connection here to the inner ear and in the inner ear you have then the microphone the microphone that picks up the sound from the outside but this microphone is in many many microphones for many, many frequencies, for high pitch sounds and for low sounds, we have for each individual one, we have a battery of thousands of microphones distributed here. That's how the ear works. The sound comes in and finally reaches it. Now we want to have a closer look and learn a little bit about the ear because we want to make money. <laughs> so, um, first we want to now learn a little bit about sound. I think we are going to hear now the movie from our opera singer, and I assume she will be singing. This is Emma Falk. So we see. And now, now if we have this sound of Emma, 
we will realize that there are several attributes of the system. First, the loudness. How loud does the master? Second is how uh, how high is her voice? And the third is what is her typical Emma voice that we can recognize Emma from from uh, uh, from Lindbergh and from from other uh, students in the book. So that is what we want to understand now. So let's now first start to do an experiment and look at sound as physicists and not just as opera singers. So in general now begin a series of experiments. We will generate with one of these uh, um, loudspeakers a tone and we have our oscilloscope connected to the computer screen where we are showing this, this tone. And you see what sound is, it's actually a wave. It's a wave-like uh, uh, motion of the molecule of the air. Now, we now change this frequency and make it higher. Do you see what happens in this one? The oscillation becomes faster and faster. First, it's slow, and then it's fast. <laughs> so this is what sound is. We also have amplitude. Can you make it also loud? Make it out. See, the amplitude goes up. Uh, when, when it becomes louder, the amplitude goes higher. So the fit for the physicist, loudness is amplitude of the oscillations, and the pitch, the, the highness of the tone, is how rapidly things, things, uh, things go. Okay, now we will do a different, we will look at this a different meaning. The key property of a sound is the frequency, how often it, it oscillates. And here we have now an instrument called an oscilloscope that tells us the frequency of this particular sound. And this is a very famous frequency that's very important for musicians. You might wonder when you go to this big concert, what are they doing? Do they all play with the instrument before the music starts? They all to be sure that every instrument, when it plays a certain tone, it's the same frequency for all the instruments. And the, the frequency the instruments use is just this 440 hertz. <coughs> now make it a little higher, the frequency. Let's see what happens to this. Now make it a little higher. See, when we go higher, this frequency moves. Now we are at uh, 500, uh, at 600, 700. Ah, I cannot take it anymore. Stop it, stop it, please. <laughs> so, so we see that we see the frequency, just the frequency. And now we can move the frequency to higher pitches. What if we have two sounds? What happens then? Does it all fall apart? Let's try to make an instrument with two, uh, an experiment with two sounds. So, so we have two loudspeakers. You will see that here. So now we have one loudspeaker is connected to this sound source and the other one to this one. So this is one of them. Okay, we see this signal. Now do the other one. Now we add the second one, where do you see the second one? Oh, now you see we have two, we have two, two, two uh, sound sources here. One makes this frequency, the other one the other frequency. Add it there, it's the other one. So if we have two of them, we're getting two frequency back. Sounds awful, but that's how it is. <laughs> so, so we can add frequencies. Now, now, uh, now the next thing we do is, we, uh, we look now at real sound, not at this awful sound. So let's have Emma sing again. Emma, please sing. So now she, she sings another tone. And Emma is now, and now we record Emma's, Emma's frequency, the, the frequency of her voice. So, can we see it? Sound engineer or acoustic engineer works hard. So we have to be a little patient, it's a real experiment. So, so she sings a tone, but what we see here, that you have to tell me when, when you see you, you, you have what you want to show us. So when you are done, you tell me. Uh, So, 
what we see in her voice is many frequencies. Uh, you can not see that very well. Uh, so, so I have to, I, I have to pull it, I said, experiment will always work well. So what we would see in the human voice is not just one frequency, even though Emma was supposed to also sing A, and we would have expected that she just sings 500, uh, uh, 440 hertz, uh, that is about uh, 440 times a second the sound was up and down, but we would have seen also an 880 hertz peak, a 1,320 hertz peak, and many, many other frequencies. So if, if Emma speaks, we, uh, Emma sings, we actually have uh, three frequency peaks. And let me sing one. Can I maybe sing yeah. one? Yeah, sure. So let me try that for my whole sound. So I would like to also make a name, but I'm totally wow. unmusical.
very good. Then they can drink out so that they cannot hear when the when the fat goes. <laughs> so last quickly on the phone, so we can sleep we have a few minutes of eye, we want to cut the real music. Real music, what we show here is the frequencies of real music. It has many, many frequencies. And you see here it's a uh, you know, like all kinds of frequencies. So just play it. It's a piece by Schubert. Okay. Now, see, at this moment here, suddenly lots of frequencies go away. So what we want to do is, we want to look at it, what is happening there. So now play this, and now I ask you then what is happening. So play it again, that's, that's this piece. Can you go back to the beginning? Yeah. So, yeah. you see where we are. Here we go. The violence went away. The violence went away. That's what happened there. But now look at the frequencies. The violence, they all play full of the A tone or, or similar frequencies. And those frequencies are here are the frequencies. This is where the violent frequency, where the violins are playing. They are normal tone, but you see the violins have many, many higher frequencies because the violin has a very high pitch voice with many, many high frequencies. That is how you recognize the violin. And so when you hear music instruments, you just don't hear the one tone they play, but you hear also the many overtones and many other frequencies. But that makes it very expensive to play the music. And now what you can do is, you can simplify it by cutting off the frequency which all people like me don't hear anyway. <laughs> and you can simplify the other frequencies, just like you see this fine picture of Chen and the coarse picture of Chen. You can recognize them immediately. And now let's play this kind of music. So, and you will see the music here with this with this equipment, it sounds the same. Just like, like he, uh, Chen looks here the same there, with cut down cut out frequencies and, and coarser representation of frequencies, we, we save one ten, factor one ten of size of the music we put on our iPhone. And as a result, we can play ten times more pieces on the iPhone. So, finally, we look at the eye, how is the eye microphone working? I told you already that this piece of the eye, this is how it looks under the microscope, uh, is really doing the tone. And how this happens is actually just physics. Here we see where the tones are being measured. This is where all the microphones for all the frequencies are located. And here you see the microphone that nature made. When you go along this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 this chain, there are little hairs. And these hairs are vibrating forth and back. They are connected to each other by little strings. strings. Here we see, also under the microscope, how this, how this hair moves when sound comes. And, and now here you see that all these little hairs are connected there with a little string. And here is the string, how it looks like. And the string is being pulling open a little hole at the top of these things here of these hairs, and that is an iron channel, and when it pulls open, then the ions leave, the, leave the, the hairs, and then the hairs getting different, having different electric, electrical charge inside, they have, a different, uh, they have a different voltage, and that voltage goes to the brain and tells the brain, oh, I heard this frequency. So here we see how sound is really transformed into electricity, an electrical signal that goes to the brain. So again, you see at the very end of the of the process of hearing that physics comes to the brain. Now, very briefly, we want to have fun with the eye. Here, we, here I show you now the most impressive instrument of the human body, the eye. But it evolved in, 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 in biology. It started with just a very flat, 
sensitive spot on the skin where uh, animals, the simple uh, uh, seashells, for example, can just detect that there is a shade acting on them or not. Then they make a hole that developed then in the evolution of the pin camera, just like a box with a little hole and a little, uh, on, on, if you have a hole in front and you have then a, a white paper in the back, you can then just with this simple camera projected image onto the eye, and here you now have the, the, the sense, the bright sensitive cells that detect if light falls onto the eye. Then, then nature fills this eye with a gel, just like water, except it is firm, and it developed then a lens. The lens became finer, was protected through, an, through a film that was uh, that is, uh, like, a, like, a, like a thick skin, that, that protects the lens, and this is the eye today that we have in humans, in cows, and in, uh, in monkeys. So, this is a, the whole eye looks like, like the human eye. We have a lens, we have here a big glass body, like a gel, like gelated water, and here you have all the receptor cells that detect if light falls through the eye. And now we want to make experiment on, on an eye. This is how a real eye looks like. And of course you can only do experiment with an eye if you have an eye. So we needed an eye. And uh, also, it's not so easy to get an eye. But uh, I have fairly uh, devoted students. They also know that they want to finish one day their PhD. And so, um, okay, good. So. Um, so I found a volunteer. <laughs> oh, oh, it's, coming on. <laughs> it's always a woman. It's always a woman. So, so um, and then nice. Uh, then that you do this eye. Hope it, I hope it works. Good one. <laughs> okay. So now, what they do is they are going to dissect the eye. <laughs> okay, what we do is we are going to cut through the eye, this is Jen and then Marcos. You will see that under the camera. Can you connect the camera? And uh, they, like, they cut the eye through like this. And the first thing they want to look at is the lens of the eye. So you will see that uh, the lens of the eye is just like a camera lens. It's, a, it's a, just a wonderful thing. So they see it under the camera, we see the eye, and, uh, and now they will touch it. Okay, so why don't we let them do that? You have to, you have to use fresh eyes, so you get actually the eyes from the, from the slaughterhouse. We got them uh, ready to get them actually. Uh, Marcos? In Homa. In Homa. Homa. Yeah. Okay. So we got them in Homa, um, in English country. And so now they're dissected. Uh, they will show us in a second that we see what, what, is, what we have there. Okay. Looks a little bloody at the moment, but. Uh, uh, you will be amazed what you see in, in a second when we, when we, uh, so there you see the, there you see the lens, there you see the lens, can you be sure that the camera sees the lens? Yes. Oh, so there is the lens. By the way, in a very similar operation, hopefully a little bit finer, at part, we can change the lens of the eye when you have cataracts, they take the lens out and replace it with, with another lens. But now we see uh, a, cow, a cow eye lens, and you see that just in a few seconds, you see it, and now when you can be, maybe I go here to my, here you see that the lens here, this is actually um, a picture that we took, and you might be able to see that it's like a magnifying glass. You see a little bit, it's a little bigger. We let some of you look at it later, but you can see the, 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 the prints a little bit magnified. So, uh, you are out of focus. You are out of focus. Okay, there. You see that there? Yes? Okay.
okay. And we can also, you can also, so can you also hold it so not like with me? Then you hold it in front of you, but a little bit further away, then you see that the face of Marcos looks inverted. So when you are close, it's like a, like a magnifying glass. When you are further away, it's like inverts the image. So I don't want to give you a real serious physics lecture. Here I just show you that the lens is actually made of proteins that are formed many, many sheets like this, very, very angular, but you can see through, so they really appear like glass. And here you see a, neck, a bigger picture, where you see that you can actually use it just like a camera lens, and you hold it away from you, then suddenly you see the inverted image, and this is the physics of it. The physics students here will, will recognize it, from high school, you learn here how a camera lens works. When you're close, when you are magnifying the object you see, and when you're further away, you're inverting the object that you see. So I don't want to tell you this, but any sort of high school student learns that this is how glass lenses work. But here we see now that lenses from cows, and of course humans also, human lenses also work exactly like glass lenses. Now, Let's look at the other part of the eye. So now what they do is they, 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 they look at the back of the eye, we have cut the eye through like this. Now we look at the back one, we remove the, the, the gel inside the eye, and then we see the back of the eye, this is how it looks like. So, so now, focus on it, focus. Actually, you have to put light on there. So, yeah. So you see that now. Okay. So now, uh, so what do you see? What is this one there? What do you see there? Anybody recognize this? Good. Very good. Very good. Here are some I have an excellent audience. This is a raccoon. <laughs> and now we see even better. Yeah, you see the tail of the raccoon, the head, the, the head. So the raccoon has shiny eyes because the raccoon has. This background is called the tapetum. You know, this is this, this many the people all talk Latin so that they can charge more. Uh, it just tapestry. So at the back of the eye, you have a tapestry that shines like that. And animals that roam around at night uh, have this one in their eyes so that they can use the light twice. They can use the eye, and when it leaves the eye, uh, other animals have it too, like cats and dogs and cows. Humans don't have uh, a tapetum. Um, not quite. Um, my graduates, uh, why do, why do uh, the humans don't have a tapetum? Because they should sleep at night. <laughs> Except my graduate students, they should, they should not. And if you look in their eyes, come down, you might see them glowing a little bit because of all the night work that you saw. Okay. Now, uh, we want to look at the most impressive part of the eye. And that is a thin film that we are now working on there that is covering the back of the eye where the detector of the lights are. Because uh, the, light, the eye has to detect the image that falls onto the eye. And this is, this is a very thin film that you can very hard to, to recognize and here you see a little bit what it's made. The little blood vessels go through it. It's a very thin film. And now we want to look at this film. What this film is, is it has, it has uh, cells that can detect the light. It has thin cells and thick cells. They are called cone and rod cells. And they can detect the light in all the places in the eye. And do you know how many uh, of these receptor cells there are in the human eye where we can detect it? It's the same like in the CD camera. But in the CD camera, you have like 8 million available camera. You know how what the eye has? The eye has more receptors, more CD points, like in our camera, than there are citizens in the United States. It has over 300 million. That is a revolution of art. And this magnificent piece is, we want to look at now. Can we now see the, the retina? 
So now we, now we take the retina there, and now see if you can recognize it. This little film there, this little innocent looking film, super micro miniaturized, is the retina of the eye with more, with about 300 million receptor cells. But you see it's connected to the eye, you, can, you cannot get it out there. Why is it connected there? Pull it out. Oh, you cannot. Why not? Why not? Because we have to get the signal out from all these receptors to the brain, so that the brain knows what we see. And so this little sperm is connected on the other side. Can you show this now? It's connected on the other side to an exit strand. Little down, little down. The exit strand, this one here, this contains now many, many million nerve strands that tell the brain from the front of the eye to the back of the eye, the, our visual brain, all the signals that came out there. So this is how this magnificent uh, piece of instrument works. So here you see the, 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 the retina coming out with its 300 million nerve cells. And now, this is how the eye looks like. And now, this is where the signals go to the brain. There's a little problem there. So you may not believe the story. There's a little problem there. You soon will believe me. Because where the signals go to the brain, we cannot see. We are blind. So everywhere the eye we can see, except where the signals go, that we just saw there under the camera. So now we would like to do an experiment. We gave you a piece of paper. I hope all you, you all have it still with you. And now, if you don't, I, I still have a few more here. Everybody has, very good. Now what we do is, we want to discover the point in our eye where the signal goes to the brain. So now, I rotate with you, and now what you do is, you, you close your right eye, you hold this piece of paper in front of you, and now you look with your left eye, this eye here, you look on the, on the cross here, on this, on this cross. And then you are slowly moving this thing to you, and you watch out without looking at it there. You, you stare with your eye there, point. and then you will see at one point, you will see it disappear. Here the eye already disappears. All of you should see it. So keep it like this. Close your right eye. Look with the left of the cross. Keep the keep looking there. And then about at this distance, the point disappears. Keep looking at the cross. Keep looking at the cross. Actually, can we turn the light on? So, so how do we take it this more light? We can do the experiment with you later. But at this moment, you see exactly where in your eye the, the signals with the 300 million nerve cells go to the brain to tell your brain all about the world outside. What will? You are great. You are very good. Okay. So now you even the experiment. Thank you very much. So now I can stop in my lecture. I think we work very hard. This is a, a picture of the eye. Here we see the 300 million rough cells of the look like, again seen with an electron microscope. The fat cells and the long cells. The long cells are just to see the, the intensity of the light, and these short ones are to see the colors. And the inside of these, of these uh, um, cells are proteins that are sort of looking for a, a formula like this, and they contain a molecule that is here, a very, very small molecule that is a, a millionth of a millionth of, a, of an inch. And uh, this is where the, 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 the eye detects the light. Light comes in, and now look there, a little piece of this molecule. It's just the smallest, with just one atom, one atom on you, all takes around, the light is going onto this, uh, uh, onto this uh, eye. How does light go onto the eye? So if I maybe do it again, you see that just one atom goes around, and this is enough for the eye to pick up 
that like ferrotate. You see there, this is the system molecule here changes and grows up there. And this changes then something, the chemistry inside the eye. And that is being detected by the eye. And that is being detected by the man. And the light comes there. But light acts on this molecule one light quantum at a time. Light quantum? What is a light quantum? Ah, it's different. But we can believe it because Einstein told us so. <laughs> so the light comes in units, it falls on the eye, it excites the eye, it tells the brain with at 300 million points that we have seen the world. And that is just really a wonderful, magnificent instrument that we have there. And that's my final slide. And uh, I hope you learned something this morning that there is not only physics in Lewis, that there is not only physics in atoms, in the universe, in the TV set, there are also a lot of